Let me pray for us just as we come into God's Word, and uh, it's a doozy today, so I hope you uh, strap in. Jesus, thank you uh, that you love us and that you have the best for us, uh, that your Word is truth, and in your truth, we can have life, and in that life, we can have the freedom from all of this world's fears and worries because we can trust in you. And we thank you, Jesus, for all that we've experienced so far in our worship and prayer and rejoicing in baptism. And so, God, would you lead us uh, through your word today? And Lord, uh, may your word uh, dwell in us, abide in us richly. And we do pray this in the mighty name of our Savior, Jesus. Amen. Well, good morning, Dunbar Heights family. I love the response. It's good. Um, it's so good to be with you today. If you don't know who I am, uh, my name is Dave, and I am the associate pastor of youth and young adults here, and it's my joy to be bringing the ninth word of our 10-word series on the Ten Commandments. And uh, you might remember that the first kind of four of those commandments have to do primarily with our relationship with God. And the next six kind of anchored in that, anchored in those commandments, we are then led to how do we live in community, especially as a covenant community in love, faith, and obedience. So right now we're in a passage that tells us not to bear false witness or give false witness against our, labor, our neighbor, basically not to lie, right? And like the prohibition or the no-no in the sixth commandment, sixth word, remember, you shall not murder, right? Okay, we're not going to dwell on murder. Instead, we're going to build on the foundation of life, that life itself to God is sacred. Life itself, right? And today, just like you shall not lie, you shall not lie, we're leaning in the foundation, the truth, that the truth itself is sacred. Truth is sacred, that it belongs to God, that it draws us to God, that we can actually carry that truth. So truth is sacred. And in doing that, I hope we are able to focus on this truth is sacred and how we apply that is you and I get to bear that truth, to, to share that truth, to live into that truth of God in Christ in everything. We're to bear the truth of God in Christ in everything. So let me start with a silly story. Um, back when I was uh, a teen, a young teen guy, I had this great group of friends. And that's not the case for everybody. I had this great group of teen boy friends. We did like everything together. We even had like jobs together. I don't know who in their right mind would hire a group of teen guys all together. Not just at one job, but two jobs. We worked at a German bakery together, and we worked at a movie theater together. And uh, we ate so much popcorn and so much German pastries. It was awesome. <laughs> Now, this, group, this is a tight group of friends. This is a tight group of friends. And one, when one of the guys got his bike stolen, we were like up in arms. No way, your bike is stolen. We're going to get it back. Now, across the street from me lived this guy named Mike Jones. And Mike Jones was part of this like kind of, kind of gang, this kind of group of thugs. So imagine the 80s, kind of an 80s movie and a group of thugs. That's actually this group of guys. They were these basic thugs. And they were doing all these illegal things. And so we suspected that Mike Jones and his gang had stolen the bike. So what we decided to do, we decided to do is we're going to sneak down the driveway because in Toronto there's driveways. So we're sneaking down the driveway to look in his garage to see if the stolen bike was there. So me and my group, a little posse of not tough guys, were like sneaking down this driveway. And then all of a sudden at Mike Jones's house, Mike Jones and his buddies kind of jump out, like an 80s movie, again, They're like, hey, what are you guys looking for? And, and my friend whose bike got, he, who got his bike stolen was like, we're looking for my friend Mike, and then realized, oh no, that's the guy's name. So he's like, we're looking for my friend Mike Durafella. And Mike, are you around? Mike Durafella, are you around? And it was such a ridiculous moment that they got, like, this gang of thugs were like, what? There's no Mike Durafella here. And they're like, kind of like what you'd you know, assume would be a typical 80s movie response. So we were like, oh, we got to find a friend, Mike. See ya, Mike Durafella. And we're running around looking for Mike Durafella, who does not exist, by the way, does not exist. And when we finally got to safety, we cracked up laughing because in the moment, 
in the moment, my friend had created this crazy story, right? This crazy story. Now, I say this to illustrate that in certain situations, we can be super quick to lie or twist the truth and turn it to our advantage and also not get beat up by thugs, right? And we tend to ignore or gloss over the many lies that are kind of going on all around us. So maybe we're thinking, oh, that was just a harmless little fib, a little trick, a little something. But there's so many lies that are going on all around us. And let me just illustrate that a few ways. It would be super easy for me to pick on like certain groups, like those politicians, oh, always lying, right? Or conspiracy theories, so much lies, right? Or advertisers, like, oh, those advertisers. And you think like, this, this drink is only cool and refreshing because I put it in my fridge. It's in my fridge and it's cool and refreshing. You don't do anything. But we get these sort of like lies kind of given to us that we make this cool and refreshing. And even this week, I, I had to take my car in and I don't know if the mechanics were exactly telling me the truth because I don't know my car that well. And so you're always sort of suspicious. Like, are they really telling me the truth? Or are they just lying to get me to spend more money on this part that cost a billion dollars? I don't know. But kind of joking aside, don't you feel it's getting kind of worse and worse in our culture? And it seems so much harder to trust in sources of information and I don't know if you've, you've noticed that, that there's this constant kind of fact-checking that you have to do because there's so many competing stories and conspiracies. And governments even have to set up disinformation boards. And then when those don't work, they have to disband them, right? This is always going on all around us in our culture. And the reality is we do live in a culture of lies. But it's not just political or, or commercial but at deeply personal levels too. Sorry, my throat's a little sore. I was trying to get three young kids to do what I wanted them to do this weekend, so I've lost my voice. Anyways, in uh, this article, which you may have heard of, called Five Lies of Our Culture in the New York Times, uh, an author by the name of uh, David Brooks wrote this really helpful article. You may have heard it. You may have seen it. You may have heard about it. Um, and it wasn't some Christian guy going, here's some things I hate about the culture. No, it's just pointing out a couple of things that were kind of lies that our culture clearly seems to believe. Let me just pick on two of them. The first is that career success is fulfilling. We're, we're kind of telling our young people especially that the end goal of a success in some sort of job is the pinnacle or goal of life. Now, if any of you have ever kind of just opened the book of Ecclesiastes, the language that it uses is kind of like vapor and sand. Those kind of things you grasp a hold of just kind of melt through your fingers. And so every time you kind of, oh, I got the success, and it kind of melts through your fingers, and you grab, it's never going to anchor you in anything solid. So this this goal of success in career, it, it's, it's not actually fulfilling. And another lie that our culture tells us is that you have to find your own truth. And Brooks calls this the privatization of meaning, that everyone gets to choose their own values or answers to life. And you probably see this all around you right now, where people are saying, well, this is what I am, or this is what I am. And it's it's really hard to sort of discern, like everyone's got their own truth, right? And it seems to kind of force us to go against things that seem factually true or untrue, right? And that's what he points out, that finding your own truth is actually a lie. And Brooks ends the article by saying this, no wonder it's so hard to be a young adult today. It's no wonder it's so hard to be a young person. No wonder our society is fragmenting. We've taken the lies of hyper-individualism and we've made them the unspoken assumptions that govern how we live. We talk a lot about political revolution we need. The cultural revolution is more important. So this brings us to the revolutionary reality that we have a God of truth who speaks life into us by giving us the framework 
of it, what, what it means to be truly human, truly human. So friends, I would invite you to open your Bibles, open your Bible apps, find Exodus chapter 20. We're going to look at verses 1 and 2 as we have, and we're going to look at our verse, which is verse 16. I would invite you to stand when you found that, and we will read it together. And today I'm, I'm in the ESV, but the NIV is almost exactly the same. Verse 1, and God spoke all these words saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You may be seated. So to remind us again, we're focusing on the main idea that truth is sacred. Truth, all truth from the, the truth of the amazing pictures you see on a telescope to the tiniest details, to the most beautiful ideas, to the most beautiful art. All truth and reality and interpretation of that reality belongs to God, is set apart for God, and even draws us to God. Truth is sacred. So in that light, that you and I are called to bear the truth of God in Christ and absolutely everything. And the way we're going to do that is we're going to focus in the, these two simple lenses. One is on the culture of lying that we've started to talk about, the reality and the impact of that in the light of God's Word. And secondly and briefly, we're going to look at the Christian culture of truth, the beauty and the power and the gift of living into the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So first, the culture of lying. So we're called, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. So this is a prohibition or a no-no against living a false witness or a false answer or false account, especially against someone else in the covenant community, someone else. So essentially, it's, it's don't lie. And simply it's put, do not bear false witness and don't lie against another human being. So let's just take a moment to, to break this down. Some of you will be like, this is a dumb question, but here it is. What is a lie? What is it? What are we talking about here? Well, in simple terms, it's, it's a statement that's false, right? It's denying the truth, or, or deceiving, or misleading, or fabricating, and that's where you're making things up. And many of us know little kids are really good at fabricating, right? Or omitting which is leaving things out. And most grown-ups are very good at leaving things out. Now, biblically speaking, if we look at both the passage in Exodus and we, and we go to the passage in Deuteronomy, which is the mirror passage, the second telling of the same law, this sort of false witness is, is basically described like this, something that is untrue, but also insincere. You notice that something that is actually not true, but then the character is insincere in bringing that untruth. So those are two helpful things to hold together as we go on. Now, if we're honest, most of us don't outright lie often, right? We're not like, oh yeah, the sky's green, you know, because you get caught out in those. It's just too easy to get burned by those ones. But most of us, including me, are kind of more prone to the partial truth, right? You know what I'm talking about, that partial truth? You give enough truth just to lead the person to the conclusions you want. For example, so sorry, I've been just, just so busy this week. But real truth is, I wasn't busy on the day we were supposed to meet. Wink, right? But I lead you, right, just to the conclusion I want. So why would I even lie in the first place? Why would we even lie in the first place? Why do it? Well, uh, my old professor and mentor, uh, Dr. Packer, uh, he was really helpful in pointing out the biblical reasons for lying. And he kind of gives two main ones. The first is pride. The second is malice. Pride and malice. Now, we lie out of a kind of self-preservation or, or trying to make ourselves greater, this pride, right? Or even diminishing someone or something else 
because we think ourselves may be more important or that we can kind of manipulate that truth there. Or we lie out of that character seeking to kind of inflict harm on someone else that maybe we see as an enemy or kind of in our way. So pride and malice. This kind of sounds a little like the devil. It should, right? Jesus calls Satan the father of lies, and his character has, has no truth to him. And very helpfully, I just recommend John chapter 8. If you, if you want to kind of see a, a kind of picture of some of these truth and lies and witness, John 8 is so helpful. Now you see, being trapped in a web of lies and malice, that's where we kind of get ourselves stuck. And the enemy loves to play in that space with us. Now I would add two kind of additional things which I've observed just pastorally and especially in my time as a foster parent, there's two other kind of maybe sub-reasons that that we can see why we lie. And one of them would be fear. We lie out of fear. Another would be lying out of confusion. Now fear, we may have a fear of the consequences or there's some danger happening or we even lie maybe because we kind of want something better and it's sort of a fear of missing the thing that we really want. Or confusion, and this is obviously more complex, but it's this tendency to kind of blend facts and sometimes believe the lie that we're kind of even creating in our own mind. And, And often it's made to protect us. So, even though we are given a very clear command not to lie, right, not to bear false witness, we do need to approach this subject with wisdom and with compassion as well as the clarity that God is giving us in this boundary. So why do we lie? Often, pride and malice and fears. But why is it actually wrong to lie? Why is it wrong to lie? I don't know if you thought about that. Well, the first and foremost is this, is the character of God. You see, we have a God of truth. God's character and His holiness and His perfection defines trueness. He cannot and does not lie. Now, we could probably open our Bible and find like a million verses. I just thought I'd I'd take us to Hebrews chapter 6 just to give us some encouragement. In Hebrews chapter 6, kind of around verse 17, we're seeing that God's character is unchangeable. We've even sung about that. God has an unchangeable character, and He actually uh, guarantees His promises by His character. And then verse 18, that says, so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, this is for us, we who have fled for refuge, we who need that, might have strong encouragement to hold fast the hope that is set before us. We can trust in the promises of God because God can't lie. His character doesn't change. It is impossible for God himself, who is truth, to lie. All his promises, all his promises are yes and amen in Jesus. So friends, like with all the other of the commandments, all those other words we've been looking at, we being made in the image of God both individually, each of you, and as a community together, when we lie or bear false witness, we go against the very nature of how we're created. I don't know if you've heard that, but that goes against our nature of who we are in God. And it's certainly against the God who created us and loves us. And the Bible is clear about lying. In Matthew 15, Jesus actually tells us where that's kind of coming from. He says in verse 19, for out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, slander. These are what defile a person. And what he's saying, lies like all these other things ruin you. They ruin you internally and externally. They're ruining your relationship with God and they're ruining our relationships with one another. They defile us. And a great but sad example of this is in Acts, 
the story of Ananias and Sapphira. I don't know if you know the story. It's a weird story. So if you're like, oh, what's that one? It's the one at the, in the early church where all the Christians are like, let's build the church up. Let's give to the church to build it up, right? And you have this, this couple, Ananias and Sapphira, who both have this pride and malice, somehow are lying to the church and trying to lie to God. They're trying to trick and manipulate. And the Apostle Peter gives them lots and lots of opportunities to say sorry, to repent, to change their ways, and they refuse. And a kind of amazing thing happens, a bit of a scary thing, a severe thing happens. They're actually struck dead, one and then the other. And it is for that lying. And I know we're like, God's a God of forgiveness and mercy. Absolutely, absolutely. But this is a, an example of the severity of lying. And we need to know that there is a consequence. And the Bible speaks about the reality that the kingdom of God is not for lying and liars. Now, even though there is consequences and it's difficult to hear that, it actually gets worse. Because there's consequences just for lying in general, but we're particularly looking at false witness against a neighbor, aren't we? In our passage, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. In this context, what's God doing here? He's trying to create justice and trustworthiness in the community, even protection. How's he doing that? Well, you see, false witness in a setting, particularly in a court setting, could result in irreparable damage to reputation, to livelihood, to families, and even result in death. So if false witness was brought against someone, in many cases, the result could be actually capital punishment. So there are severe consequences in this biblical context. But even now, even now, the same thing can occur, can't it? Whether in a court where there's a justice situation and a wrongful, wrongful conviction because of false witness, or sadly, we maybe see this more often in a court of public opinion or popular opinion in social media. So many of these lies have malice and pride, even racial pride or hate for the other person. I don't know if you've seen that or observed that, maybe even experienced that. How about you? Have you, have you ever been falsely accused or, or had a lie told about you or a partial, twisted truth? Maybe at school or at a job, or by friends or family? Ooh, how does that feel personally? What might that do to your reputation? Have you ever been kind of caught or felt trapped in that web of lies? that are either about you or, or maybe even you are participating in. We become trapped, enslaved to all these lies. And friends, one of the saddest and most painful examples of this in all of history is against Jesus himself. In Mark 14, it's a very clear example. Verse 55 says, Now the chief priests and the whole council were seeking testimony against Jesus to put him to death. But they could find none. For many bore false witness against him, but their testimony did not agree. There was this attempt to bear false witness against Jesus, to put him to death. And eventually they did succeed. And Pilate, the Roman overseer who, who condemned Jesus to death, even though he found no agreeing witnesses, argued with Jesus before sending him to the cross. And this is this discourse, which is super helpful for us to think about. Then Pilate said to Jesus, so you are a king. Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. For this purpose, I was born. And for this purpose, I have come into the world. So he is the king. He is the Messiah. He is the one come to save his people. For this purpose I have come into the word, world, to bear witness to the truth. That's what Jesus is here, bringing the witness, bearing the witness of the truth. Everyone, listen, this is for us, everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. It's beautiful, powerful stuff. We hear the truth and believe in Jesus. And the response of our culture and the response of Pilate is what? What is truth? What is it? What is it actually? 
And that's what our culture is constantly asking, trying to find. Now let me just wrap this up before we look to how we can apply this. You see, the violation of this command, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor, is a terrible part of the gospel story. It's a terrible part of the gospel story, leading to the crucifixion and death of Jesus. But the good news, the good news is that lies and hatred and even death could not hold Jesus in the grave. The Son of God rose. Jesus conquered death. Jesus, who is the embodiment of truth, who says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus, who is the embodiment of truth, the perfect truth of the Father, broke the lies, broke death, broke sin, and broke the tangled web of Satan. And so now, the truth of eternal life is available to you and to me that we may bear, that we may hold, that we may carry that truth. And just as a beautiful gospel summary of this, we've seen that there's a web of lies all around us. But friends, the truth sets us free. Remember those first few verses that we read in Exodus chapter 20? And God spoke all these words saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, who out of the house of what? Slavery. Out of the house of slavery. He brought us salvation, freedom, freedom from the lies of our world and culture, from our personal lies, from sin, from slavery to the devil's tactics. Yes, before that, we are trapped and enslaved to false stories in ourselves and in our culture. But Jesus himself says, I'm going to go back to John 8. This is sweet. If you abide in my word, if you, if you remain in my word, the word of truth, the gospel truth, you are truly my disciple and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. And he says this, so if the sun sets you free, you are free indeed. So what do we do with the truth of freedom? Briefly, let's just consider what it might look like. And I'm just going to give a few little things to send us out with. As we focus on the main idea that truth itself is sacred. It belongs to God, set apart for God, even drawing us to God. And that you and I are called to bear the truth of God in Christ in absolutely everything. What might it look like to live out this command at its heart? You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. What does it look like? It looks like love. It looks like justice. And it looks like freedom. It looks like love because as we're called to love the Lord our God with all our hearts and souls and minds and strength, we're also called to love our neighbor as ourself. We don't lie to our neighbor or about our neighbor or with our neighbor but we love them and we guard the truth in their lives. Just one example of this is is gossip. Just speaking rotten things about someone else. Even partially true things, right? Or putting a spin on things just to sort of set someone or single someone out. Christians are people who stop gossiping in their own lives and when they hear it. He's put a stop to it. Like the term false witness, it's, it's a way, gossip is a way of, of hurting someone else's reputation, even destroying their lives and careers. No, we bear the truth and do not use facts to harm or against someone, but to guard and be for them, even, friends, if they've done wrong. Because we want to be people who are trustworthy and safe and a space of freedom in Christ for others. And when that sounds hard, just remember, this is a command not just for you as an individual, but for us as a whole community. We do this together. We live out this truth together. 
And let me mention one more way. There's a million, million ways of bearing the truth. There are so, so many ways. When we bear the truth, especially to our neighbors, we are called to witness and speak the truth of God, the gospel of Jesus, in everything we do and say. Now, friends, I don't know if you saw it, but baptism is a brilliant example of this. It's a beautiful example of the gospel, the truth being born, being witnessed into the life of someone. Whether it's from the time they're a little kid with their parents and their family or in Sunday school with their Sunday school teachers or in youth or in young adults or beyond whether it's through friends and other family and people all around. It's the gospel, the truth, being born into someone. And the result is freedom. It's being brought into the freedom of Christ. And so you and I get to actually stand with Maya, stand with her in her faith, and we get to practice out our own salvation as she has borne the truth to us She has borne that truth to us, that there's a life in Jesus even when it gets hard. Surprise. So friends, we've heard the story of of lies in the culture, the call to bear the truth of Christ, the truth of God in Christ in everything. This beautiful truth of salvation and freedom. So I just leave you with this question. How can you, how can you bear the truth? How can you carry the truth? How can you give the truth of God in Christ in everything you do and say? And each of us is differently wired, aren't we? So as you bear the truth of God in Christ, you have gifts to do that. Maybe it's in a couple of weeks where you're thinking, I could join one of the teams. I could be a part of a team that bears the truth of God in Christ on a worship team or greeting or in kids' ministry, or in youth, or in young adults. You get to bear the truth of God in Christ. Maybe that's you. Maybe you are called to do that. And how can you bear the truth of God in Christ, particular to your neighbor, to the community? What does that look like from your home and outward? What does that look like from right here in Dunbar outward? How can we bear the truth of God in Christ out to the world? I'm going to let you do the hard work because that is what God by His Spirit is doing. He's saying, how do you do that? There's so many ways to do that. He invites us into doing that. So friends, we were called by God in this beautiful ninth word. You shall not bear false witness. We realize that the truth is sacred and that we are called to bear that truth of God in Christ in everything we do. Amen? Amen. Amen.